All right, looks like everybody's in. Um, welcome to the IFMA New York City webinar on cybersecurity for smart buildings. This is the sixth of a six webinar series on workplace technology. The call is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel later this week. Please feel free to submit any questions you may have into the chat box for our moderator. Also, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. At that point, if you would like to unmute yourself to ask a question, please feel free to do so. I'd like to introduce our presenter. Mr. Branting is the Automated Sa Automation Sales and Business Development Manager for Siemens Smart Infrastructure, serving the metropolitan New York area. Dustin has been in the field of HVAC and BMS for over 17 years. His roles include designing unique solutions to complex problems for commercial, healthcare, and pharmaceutical. Dustin has his Bachelor of Science in HVACR Engineering from Ferris University in Michigan and lives in New Jersey. Thank you, Justin. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so this is uh, the Siemens Cybersecurity for Smart Buildings um, presentation. So this is an AIA uh, accredited course. So uh, everybody will get a PDH uh, for attending the, the presentation. Um, so we'll have everybody's names and then everybody will get uh, a PDH uh, certificate from us uh, sent directly to them. So some of the learning objectives we have in this presentation will be understanding how the building automation systems have now become more of a target uh, than they were in the past. Uh, an introduction to some of the fundamentals of identifying the cyber threats that are coming our way, uh, some of the challenges that we have um, in addressing these, and then we'll review some recommended security measures for how you protect this, um, you know, how, what kind of practices uh, can be implemented to make sure that the systems are more secure uh, moving forward, and especially as we're going into smarter facilities and buildings. Um, so this will be our agenda, you know, defining cybersecurity, the challenges we face, um, what some of those frameworks and standards are to address it, uh, how we apply them, and then the best practices. So high level, um, from Cisco, the definition they had for cybersecurity um, is the practice of protecting systems, networks, and programs from digital attacks. Um, usually aimed at accessing, changing, or destroying sensitive information, extorting money from users, or interrupting normal business procedures. Um, what we've seen uh, over the past, you know, decade has been, you know, uh, uh, an assortment of cybersecurity uh, threats. But these are some of the most common ones that we experience um, in our uh, environment of building automation systems. And one is ransomware, uh, which is a type of malicious software usually aimed at blocking access to files, uh, to the system um, parameters, and essentially making it, uh, you have to pay to get it back. Um, and there, there are instances where this, is, this ransom has had to get paid. Um, malware, which is a type of software to gain unauthorized access to the system. Social engineering is a tactic that people use to trick you into revealing sensitive information. This could be login inf information. Um, and then they could use it to solicit payment or gain access to the confidential data. Uh, phishing, which we'll go into a little bit more, is the practice of sending those fraudulent emails. We're, we're probably all familiar with this. Um, usually our IT network, you know, IT uh, managers are, are, you know, they may be sending out random uh, fake phishing emails just to get us uh, aware of and how to better um, recognize them. And then zero day exploitation is uh, a means of uh, finding a bug or an issue within a system before anybody realizes that it's present. Um, so it's essentially uh, from, you know, off the shelf, they're finding that vulnerability, um, exploiting it before people have a means of uh, addressing it with a patch. So these phishing attacks um, are the most common by far, you know, over 90% of the cyber attacks are based on phishing emails. 
Um, you know, it's nothing new. It's been, you know, mentioned in the industry since 1995. Um, and the danger is very real. Um, you'll hear from time to time uh, of a term called spear phishing, which is taking a phishing attack to a little bit more sophisticated um, degree where they may target a particular person or a small group of people. Um, so that way it doesn't get uh, as easily recognized by some of the filters that IT may have in place. Um, and it may make it look even more uh, real. Like it, you know, it's not as easily recognized as a phishing attack uh, when it's done this way. So in order to protect um, not just your BMS system. You know, your BMS system is what you may be in charge of managing or, or securing, uh, but we are a part of a greater uh, picture, which is the entire building, because uh, you know, we're only as secure as the weakest link in the rest of the facility. So there's a holistic approach that has to be had to uh, taking care of the systems. Uh, and this, can, this is gonna have to start with our uh, organizational culture. Um, you need to have an IT, you know, group in place, you know, driving those strategies, those policies, and those procedures through the organization, bringing the education and awareness to everybody, um, so that everybody's on board and everybody understands what a phishing email is, how to recognize it, uh, what kind of uh, software you may or may not be allowed to download um, onto the network. There's the physical uh, security, which could include, you know, building access control, uh, physical HMIs, locks and guards. Stateful firewalls. This is where uh, you now to, you're having a perimeter between uh, the outside world and, and uh, essentially the, the inside of the office, the building, um, where the IT department will set up, you know, VPNs to get to the secure networks. Uh, they may set up DMZs. This is where the, the firewalls are going to reside. The network security, uh, they may have a logical uh, or virtual segmentation of the networks uh, so that everybody can be kept within a, a smaller bubble instead of the everybody all together. Uh, authentication, authorization, um, and intrusion detection and response. The host security is your patch management, virus, malware protection, hardening, uh, and we'll get into hardening uh, a little bit later. Then your lastly, your application security, where you have your actual passwords, uh, your vulnerability management, uh, your best practices and authentication. So what is a smart building network? Um, you may have heard IT versus OT, uh, the convergence of these two networks. So IT is something that we may all be familiar with towards the bottom there. And that's the traditional IT network um, that composes the servers, the workstations, uh, maybe even mobile devices, high number of connections, a lot of bandwidth. You'll have IDF rooms, MDF rooms um, scattered throughout the facility. And usually they're managed by like a well-established IT department with uh, a, you know, a, a plethora of cybersecurity tools to make sure everything stays protected. Um, and then you have your OT, which is going to encompass more of the, uh, the building systems. So this could be a group of, you know, like non-homogenous systems, um, but you'll have typically fewer connections. Uh, we don't require as much bandwidth uh, typically as, as the IT systems. Um, they're gonna be, you know, they may be physically distributed throughout the entire facility. Uh, and this can include, you know, legacy bridges, proprietary protocols, non-IP systems, um, and it could be a, a, just a, a massive assortment of anything from SCADA systems, building automation. Um, you could be integrating your lighting control, security, um, vertical transportation. All these are considered OT type networks that are now being uh, pulled together um, that are usually managed by the facilities department. So some of the challenges we're experiencing is that uh, the events are on the rise. Um, and the cybersecurity, uh, pe the people going after our systems are becoming more sophisticated. Uh, we're becoming a, a much uh, more recognized component of the building. And as that, as such, are more of a target. Um, for a long time, we had the, the 
ability to be, um, and, you know, nobody really thought about going after the, the building automation system. We were typically uh, in a bubble of our own and weren't necessarily targets. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll show a couple of uh, situations where, you know, the BMS was the entry point into uh, the greater IT network. Um, so hackers are recognizing that we are an entry point now and our visibility is greater. Um, so here are some of the trend uh, and research is um, we have, you know, we're, we're now being included with um, Cisco and, and some of the other um, agencies that are looking after. Um, and the three most common observed themes that they found and that we found were that uh, adversaries are taking malware to a, to a far more uh, unprecedented levels of sophistication and impact. Um, the adversaries are becoming more adept at um, evasion and weaponizing cloud services um, as more of our systems are now going that direction. And they're exploiting undefended gaps in our security, uh, most of which stem from the expansion of IoT and cloud services. Um, so we are now becoming uh, a smart buildings are engaging and utilizing IoT applications as well as cloud services. And that's now uh, putting us in the forefront of some of these situations. So by the numbers, um, you know, these are reports from 2018. 2,100% increase in industrial attacks over the past three years, 3.8 million in typical financial impact for a single cyber attack. Uh, and obviously these are for larger institutions. Um, 300,000 uh, plus number of new malware programs created every day. Um, so then you take a look at the bottom two, 928 number of cloud applications used on an average enterprise system. So this is a big increase. We're now using a lot more cloud systems um, on top of uh, our traditional um, enterprise and 547 million plus uh, estimated investment in IoT. Um, so it's not going to go anywhere as buildings become smart. We are going to find that we have to go the route of using more cloud-based services and IoT components, um, which is going to force us to have to recognize the impact of that. So this is a little bit older chart, but what it does is kind of show the progression of uh, cybersecurity attacks and events um, and the sophistication uh, change. So, you know, back from 2002, you know, you'd hear of worms and viruses and, and antivirus and it stayed relatively um, low impact. But then as you get into the 2010 era, and, and moving forward, um, this is now ballooned uh, much, much faster with the number of events um, just multiplying on a daily basis uh, with much more sophisticated and targeted attacks um, as they are looking for critical infrastructure. And so this, this picture here kind of shows that there's, there's a time to detect from when uh, somebody may have gained unauth unauthorized access to the system and how long before that actually impacts uh, what's going on or somebody realizes it. So on an average basis, it takes over a hundred days before uh, IT may recognize that something has happened. So these malware programs, these ransomware programs um, can be put onto the system and be left dormant uh, and be allowed to be you know, navigating through the system before anybody realizes that it's there. So it, it takes time to detect um, some of these compromises to the system. And what they're typically targeting is they're looking for, a, you know, bang for the buck, if you will, um, industrial control system vulnerabilities that can place the critical infrastructure uh, at risk. So 31% of the organizations have experienced cyber attacks on OT infrastructure, um, as you'll see here on the right, and this is from Cisco, you know, but some of those targets include large international water treatment, wastewater processing companies. Um, in that particular case, the DMZ server was breached um, because of a misconfiguration. Uh, another target was a power plant breached to the system um, 
and then large retail. Um, and we've, we've, you know, I, I'm pretty sure everybody's remembered it. It's been a while back, but when Target um, was, uh, you know, was, was hacked and malware was used um, at the retail point of sale. So using the retail point of sale is going to be obviously what they're interested in for this large retail. So any avenue they can get there um, to, you know, is what they're going to use. So these are some of some older examples, but you know, back in 2012, um, an individual used the Shodan search engine to locate the Tritium Niagara systems that were connected to the internet and posted a list of those URLs. And a backdoor URL gave access to the graphical user interface, which provided floor plans uh, of the office, uh, control fields, and feedback for each office and shop area. Um, that was just you know, a, a single instance there of, of realizing the impact because um, these systems are spread out throughout you know, the US and throughout the globe. Um, another here was in 2013, uh, security firm connected a series of fake um, industrial control systems to the internet to, to mimic the SCADA devices used uh, to run those power plants. And then the objective was to, to test to see where the vulnerabilities were and within 28 days, they had research detected 25 sustained impacts um, or sustained attacks from 11 different countries. So once those things were out there, people did go after them. Uh, and this was an ability for them to realize where their problems were, but also it showed the significance of how quickly people were to react to um, having an opportunity to get into these systems. So we're now, um, we're on the list, you know, this is the, from 2014, the top 10 security threats. Uh, and they're at number six, control components connected to the internet. Um, high exposure and difficult to detect. Um, so we're, we're moving up that ladder of systems that are now, um, you know, not only exposed, but, uh, you know, in danger of being compromised and, and forcing us to realize we have to take new measures to protect those. And so the cost of an un, you know of, of an unmitigated cybersecurity risk could be um, could be anything. It could be small. It could be large. Depends on the organization that you're responsible for uh, taking care of. Anything from you know monetary damage, a loss of security goals, uh, but it could be something you know massively significant, like intellectual property loss uh, or legal liability and risk. Um, so you have to start asking those questions. What happens if remote access isn't secure? Um, do the access control systems really prevent attackers from accessing our building? And you know, are the IT systems separated from those IT systems that are very sensitive where a lot of critical information can be stored? Um, we really have to begin asking those questions um, because we are converged with IT in a lot of these situations and cases. So there are agencies, there are frameworks, there are standards that are out there that are being used um, to help ensure that these systems stay secure. And it could be, you know, anything from Homeland Security to US Department of Energy. There are different standards, different procedures for every one of those, ASHRAE weighs in. Uh, but typically the most common one um, for us is gonna be NIST the IEC and the ISA. Those we will frequently see uh, in our building automation space, uh, driving standards uh, for us to follow when it comes to cybersecurity. So some of the ones that are um, referenced uh, when it comes to either a specification or a manufacturer uh, may be the NIST framework for improving critical infrastructure and cybersecurity, the cybersecurity framework manufacturing profile, the guide to industrial control system security, um, and the one that typically has the greatest impact that we we're commonly interfacing with and working with um, is the I, you know, the ISA IEC uh, 62443. Um, we often will be uh, using this as a framework for our building automation systems. And they lay a lot of things out uh, for us when it comes to security. So um, audit log records are determined and documented, implemented, and reviewed in accordance with certain policies. 
that's there recognized in 62443. Same thing goes for, you know, uh, procedures for removable media um, and systems that operate in predefined functional states. The ISA is weighing in on all of those for us to, um, to better, you know, work with. So it's got general concepts, policies and procedures, systems and components um, all identified. The general concepts are documents that overarch and apply to the entire series of standards. The policies address the organizational aspects of the policies. Uh, the system documents and addresses uh, high level technical aspects of cybersecurity. And then lastly, the components uh, document and address the component level technical aspects of cybersecurity. Um, and within each one of these, uh, there are also um, security levels. So SL1, 2, 3, and 4, and the one that we often uh, will reference is SL2, where we're preventing the unauthorized disclosure of information to an entity, actively searching for it using simple means, but low resources, uh, generic skills, and low motivation. So how do we make sense of some of these, these uh, frameworks? Um, we spoke earlier here of the holistic approach and we have to apply this holistic approach um, and everybody's gotta be involved uh, for data security to really work. Um, so what we find is that we have very complex systems, especially the larger your organization is uh, and you get into enterprise systems. So in this particular case, you have a lot of connected systems and then they may not need to be physically connected. In this particular case, actually, um, the systems don't reside on the same uh, campus. Uh, they are connected to one another. So recognizing that we have to realize that any point of entry within this greater uh, distributed system is all that's needed. Um, so it could be, you know, recognizing the, the potential impact there at a meter um, or, you know, that could get its way up into the, the BAS system, uh, into the grid. Um, all of these entry points have to be uh, recognized, addressed, because these are, our systems are becoming larger integrated building management systems. Uh, all these components are integrated together as a single cohesive front, um, especially, you know, in smart buildings. So a pen test for anybody who's not familiar with is, is a penetration testing, which is uh, an organization will put their system up and they're usually employing somebody if they don't have their own um, people for that to find where the vulnerabilities lie uh, in their system so that they can address these. Um, so this is an example here of a digital substation that has potential vulnerability to cyber attacks. Um, so we have a critical infrastructure. They have 24 operation. They identified that there's both Windows and Linux standard components. Um, there are interfaces to unsecure networks, legacy components, proprietary technology, and a, and a mix of components from different vendors uh, with different technologies. Um, and this is very common in a smart building. You have a, a combination of a lot of these. So then I identified, you know, what are, who are the possible attackers? Um, you know, for this particular, you know, customer, it could have been states, criminal organization, uh, script kiddies, uh, or it, it could come from within an insider. Um, and so they then identify, you know, what kind of, um, entry points there are. So you'll see, you know, highlighted in red attacks via the internet up at the remote access. Uh, unauthorized access could happen there at the service PC. You could have um, misuse of administrative rights at, you know, at the, the HMI or human machine interface, malware at any kind of controller, uh, tampering of firmware at any one of the actual um, IEDs protection and field devices. So uh, migration to a secure substation. This is them then recognizing where these, uh, these points are 
uh, where the potential issues are, and then beginning to recommend, you know, how to better protect this, where, where to lay uh, particular um, mechanisms to, to keep the system secure. So they first segmented the network and found, you know, okay, here's our trusted zones, um, and then the DMZ, which is, you know, uh, essentially a pulled away so that you can have um, access to the system without getting into the internal um, trusted zones. So there's the logical segmentation here. And then recognizing what cybersecurity measures you want at each one of those um, areas. So your access control and account management, you are going to want to have that at the service PC, um, at the HMI, the router, station controller, switches, everything's going to have access control and account management. Security logging and monitoring. Um, this is going to be your way of knowing, you know, who has accessed what and when. Uh, systeming, system hardening, which we'll talk about here shortly. Um, security patching and backup and restore, restoration. You have your malware protection, and then you notice over here at that router, your data protection for system integrity and system architecture, your firewall, and then your secure remote access up here. So they're identifying all the different measures at each one of those components of that system. So that way they, they can address holistically every aspect of that integrated building management system. So how do you apply this framework? Um, one, you're, you have to set those organizational goals. Uh, you have to break down the complex system into connected subsystems and enclaves, um, which is you typically you know, a combination, combination effort of both IT and OT to define that. Um, set those priority and security levels based on the amount of impact and risk posed by any of those systems uh, and what they can comprise. Select system requirements and control strategies, reference supporting technical control documents, and select individual technical controls. So how do we make this real? Um, what can we do uh, to actually um, harden our systems? So some of the most important things to realize is that when you have new components that come out of the box that come into uh, the integrated building management system or, or, or the smart building, um, you have to remove any kind of default usernames um, and replace those with uh, obviously a new username and password, but you also need to define, um, have established password policies as an organization. Uh, avoid the group accounts. You know, you don't want to have group accounts where you have no means of, of determining uh, who within that group could have caused a problem uh, if, if indeed the problem came from within. Um, you want to be able to have the password policy in place so that everybody uses secure passwords uh, and you're not finding at, you know, applications of somebody becoming lazy and saying, oh, my password is password. Um, use least access rights management. So this is the principle of if this person only needs to have access to X, Y, and Z, let's make sure we keep it to X, Y, and Z, and we don't open up the rest of the system uh, to that user uh, since we don't need to have them accessing any more than what we've established they need access to. So that's at least access rights management. Um, and then obviously we want to monitor update and manage uh, through logging, uh, through historical records, uh, and make sure that we're, we're keeping an eye on that. Uh, from a network component, um, we want to avoid connecting those OT devices to the internet, uh, especially inbound. So as the buildings are becoming smarter, there's more and more IoT devices going into the building. Um, so we're going to want to be very cognizant of what devices are going into the building how those devices are interfacing with the existing system and whether or not those devices are going outbound uh, to other cloud hosted, um, you know, like SaaS programs uh, so that we better understand every point of entry uh, that, that could be lumped underneath the OT grouping of, uh, of components. 
uh, authenticate, authorize, and monitor network devices. Uh, this goes without saying, do not connect OT networks without a firewall and a DMZ. Uh, this is just making sure that every one of these is protected uh, and behind some kind of a protective mechanism. Um, keep the OT network physically segmented or logically segmented using VLANs. So work with the IT department and allow them to create, if it's not a physically isolated um, building automation system or smart infrastructure, um, begin to logically segment those from the rest of the IT system. So we, we definitely have to work more hand in hand with them uh, moving forward so that we can uh, pull our, our systems together. Um, a lot of times our systems are now physically uh, connected to the IT networks. We are converging. Uh, and so with that convergence still needs to be the ability to uh, logically segment our, our, um, our components from theirs. Um, system security, implement, manage, and monitor backups. Uh, and have a DR plan. Uh, we don't wanna use OT servers and workstations for email or web browsing. So we have a lot of connected systems now on these OT servers. Uh, we could have, you know, as we said before, vertical transportation is now integrated with the lighting, which is integrated with the security, which is integrated with the BMS. Um, you know, and as you get into larger facilities like airports, you have an, uh, a whole assortment of other um, airport type applications that are now also being pulled in with ours. So keep those separate and make sure that the servers are being used to do what they're intended to be used for um, and not just, hey, that's just a workstation that you also watch YouTube on and everything else. You wanna keep uh, the functionality of that server to exactly what it's specifically intended for. Um, avoid using any type of portable media or peripheral. This is common, we go to trade shows, not right now, but we have uh, for a long time. A lot of times we'll find that everybody's got a flash drive. We wanna be more cautious of this. Don't use portable media onto these OT servers without understanding you know, what is on that media. It, this is a great way of putting malware onto a system without us recognizing it. Uh, and it just feels like it would be harmless. Um, it, it certainly is not. This is uh, a mechanism that can be used to gain access. So what do we do? What are some of those takeaways? Um, reference cybersecurity standards. Uh, NIST standards are up to date. They're doing a good job of trying to stay on top of what we're doing which is constantly evolving uh, with smart buildings, with IT, the different practices they're, they're using. Uh, ISA 62443, obviously that's an, a requirement. Um, implement RBAC password policies and least privileges, which we talked about in the system hardening. Uh, for integrated connected building systems, include secure network specs and requirements. This needs to be going into the specifications for any kind of construction, any kind of service work, upgrades to systems, having those specifications for what kind of security is required by not just uh, the OT group or the facilities, but also what's required by the IT group as our systems are typically um, outward bound so that we can get alarms and schedules remotely. We need to also be coordinating with IT to make sure that we're providing uh, the correct um, policies and, and passwords, um, protocols to conform with uh, that department as well. And the manufacturers will also weigh in and they may have guidelines for cybersecurity implementation. So looking at what those uh, manufacturers guidelines are as well. Collaborating with the enterprise IT, uh, leveraging their, their IT practices. We don't we may not have as, an, as a facilities team, um, as a manufacturer, the same requirements or best practices as the ID departments. Every ID department is gonna be different based on the potential data that's on that network, the uh, type of subsystems that they have to handle. Uh, obviously a hospital is gonna be different than an airport 
than a K through 12 school. So we want to be looking at the IT's best practices uh, and implementing those as much as possible. And there's going to be uh, a, a number of institutions that are going to be providing more um, intricate data if you really want to get into uh, what those protocols procedures look like. So the ISA, uh, US Department of Energy, um, International Code, you know, and you guys will be getting a recording of this, but the websites are listed there for each one of those uh, to where we got some of this information and where you can also get in additional information uh, to actually research you know, those potential NIST standards if you want to get into those uh, a little bit more heavily. And so I try to keep it high level. Um, so now we'll go into the Q&A and if anybody has any questions, um, I'm here. Hey, Dustin, it's Justin, actually. Um, so how frequently are you asked to merge with IT groups at other companies? The majority of any smart building implementation, um, as well as any large facility, nine out of the 10 projects that we are bidding um, right now, you know, it may be for a large banking institution, a large commercial facility, every one of those is merging, uh, or they call it convergence, uh, converging the IT networks with the OT networks. And there are discussions now going on um, all the way you know, at the architecture level of what that's gonna look like, who's responsible for what, and defining you know, the specification to say, these are the principles that you need to you know, be aware of, these are the protocols that we are establishing. Um, and they're defining that now in the specifications for everybody to, to recognize. Um, because in order for a smart building to, to be smart, you have to have the ability for all these subsystems to come together and work. Um, and the most cost effective way of doing that is utilizing what is already going to be in place, which is the IT network that has the, the bandwidth necessary to make these systems uh, you know, be able to transfer the amount of data that they do, as well as use that greater infrastructure that they've built uh, to pull them all together, uh, which reduces a lot of cost uh, versus trying to do that all uh, with a complete physical, um, you know, uh, physically pulling yourself from the IT network. It would be uh, too costly to try to run completely new infrastructures um, from a networking perspective. That's why we were converging with uh, IT a lot as well. All right, thanks. Anybody else have any other questions? All right, Dustin, it looks like that is it. So uh, thank you Excuse so much. Excuse me, for doing... it's oh, Debbie. Yeah. I have a question. Of course. Hi, Debbie. Dustin, do you have any type of like a basic questionnaire that we as facilities folks should be including in our RFIs, RFPs to ask basic questions so that we know we're addressing these cyber issues? We do. Um, I'll write that down. I'm, I'm happy to get that to you. Yes, if you could send it, I think, to the whole group, it would be very helpful because when we're putting together our RFIs or our RFPs, when we talk to the people in IT, we should have some idea of what questions to ask so we can make sure that they have protocols so that we're all on the same page. Thank you, Thanks, Debbie. Dustin. Yeah, I, I will go ahead and uh, work on getting that to you. Perfect, because that would be greatly appreciated. Sure. Because obviously we're not the tech people, but we need to have information so that we can address the subject intelligently. Yeah, and, and a lot of times facilities speaks a different language than IT. Absolutely, um, absolutely. 
Um, so, I've been fortunate that I've had people that I could go to within my IT department, but sometimes it's nice to have something where you can go to them to address it so that it knows you've done some homework in advance. Yeah, absolutely. Justin, it's Meryl Efron. Would you be so kind to include your email address in the chat box in case anyone else has questions that they can send you in the next day or so? In the chat box. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I think that would be very helpful. So just, um, Justin, if you could just leave it up for a minute so that way everybody can jot it down. And yeah, of we'll course, do. the uh, presentation will be available on YouTube as well. So I just put that into the chat box. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for uh, participating and Dustin for a great, very thorough presentation. It was very enlightening. And uh, this is the end of our six workplace technology webinars. So thank you for bringing it to a conclusion. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Bye-bye right. now.